السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين Thank you so much for having me. It really is a pleasure to be here with you all. Coming all the way from America, my first time in Malaysia, and I feel like I'm at home, subhanAllah. I feel like I'm amongst family here. So thank you for your warmth and your hospitality, mashallah. I'm, I'm here to present today on something that is very near and dear to my heart. This is a topic that I love to study and I love to talk about. I love to read about, and I'm, I'm so honored to be here to share it with you on the topic of prophetic pastoral care. Essentially, our Prophet, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how did he exhibit spiritual care? How was he like a chaplain? What can we learn from him as a chaplain that we can use in our work? So a little bit of background. Um, when I was growing up in America, I learned the seerah and the life of the Prophet وسلم, from books. So we had classrooms, we had halaqas, and I would read about his life. But the seerah that we had in books, I don't know if it's the same for you, but we had it like um, events. Here on this date, this happened, and then this happened, and then this event happened, and then he went here, and then he did this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the, the material was very dry, and it was lacking anything in the heart. I didn't feel a connection to our beloved Prophet I just had knowledge, I had it all in my head, but it wasn't coming down to my heart. Much later, when I started my program at the hospital, I was amongst all Christians. One Buddhist, mostly Christians, and I was the only Muslim. But the program is very Christian-based. So everything that they taught about chaplaincy was from the point of view of Jesus, of Isa alayhi salam. He did this, he served others, he washed their feet, he was kind to them, on and on and on. And it made me think, where are the examples from my tradition of my beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Where are the stories that I can bring to my chaplaincy work? Where, where is mine? Where's mine? I wanted to find my own. So I went back to all of the seerah books that I had, and I laid them out, and I started rereading them, but this time with a fresh pair of eyes, with the eyes of a chaplain, with the eyes of somebody who wants to speak to people from the heart to their heart, not from the brain. And what I found blew me away, blew me away the examples, the stories. I don't even think I have enough time today to share everything, but I hope to give you a glimpse of the things that I learned. When we talk about our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we talk about him as a mercy to the world, rahmatan lil alameen. But have you thought about what that really means? What does that mean? How is he a mercy to the world? What did he do? Can you think of stories? Can you think of real examples from, from his life that exemplify? We talk about it all the time. We, oh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Rahmatan lil alameen. But really, what does that mean? So I invite you today, we're going to go and look exactly to see what that means, inshallah. So in our work here with spiritual care, the number one goal for me is bring back the example of the Prophet And to me, if I were to summarize his mercy in two words, it would be love and service. Love and service. And I, I have two kids. This is how I teach them about the Prophet Leaving all the dates aside, I say he was love and service to other people. The reason I say love and service is they go hand in hand. Love is the feeling, and the service are the acts by which the feeling comes. And I'll, I'll expand on this in a minute. Service is how we show love. So I learned this very early on in the hospital where mostly I'm serving non-Muslims. I do serve Muslims, but non-Muslims, when they see me come in and I have my hijab on, I get a number of different reactions. 
most of it is curious. I'm like, you're the chaplain here? I thought chaplains were Christians, not Muslims. So when I come into the room, I come now in, in the mindset of how can I serve you? And wallahi, it opens the heart like no other way to serve. So I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, a young man whose wife came in uh, to the emergency room because she tried to commit suicide. She tried to kill herself by taking a lot of pills. So she was uh, sedated. She was not conscious in the bed. So when I came in to visit with the husband, I spoke with him a little bit, and he said, do you have a prayer that I could say after we wrapped up our visit? I said, sure. And so I wrote something down for him on a piece of paper, and he took the piece of paper and he folded it, and he went and he put it under his wife's pillow. And in my head, I'm thinking, that's not how you do it. You're supposed to take the prayer and read it and pray it. But he put it under her pillow. So I let that go. When he took the piece of paper from me, his hands were shaking like this. And subhanAllah, Allah was merciful enough to put in my brain, why don't I bring him just a cup of herbal tea, something to relax him a little bit. This She had just come in. So I excused myself and I went and I made the cup of tea and I came back and I handed it to him. And, and he, he was very surprised and grateful and took it. The next day, I came back in to check on his wife and the husband had gone home and he wasn't there. So the wife was alone in the room. The minute I came in through the door and she saw me, she said, my husband told me about you. You're the one who brought him the tea. And if you think about this story, it's really interesting what he chose to share with her. He did not say I came in and I counseled him. He didn't talk about my prayer. He didn't talk about any of the things that as a chaplain I do. What he remembered was just that cup of tea. And she told me that meant so much to him. Thank you for that. That was a real learning lesson for me. Love and service. When you feel love in your heart for other people, as our beloved Prophet did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we'll talk more about how we saw the good in everybody, sallallahu alayhi, your service will become a manifestation of that, and people will feel it, and you don't have to say much. Okay. So the first point here that I want to talk about is the embodiment of compassion and empathy. In my second presentation later today, I'll talk more about empathy, but right now I want to focus on compassion. Compassion, in other words, love and feeling and support and feeling like the other person is, is important to you. These are some of the ways that I found in the seerah that the Prophet وسلم, displayed compassion. And the first one that really caught me was the way that he displayed emotion. He was a very emotional man, sallallahu alayhi. He kissed children. He sat his daughters next to him. In, in a culture where women were not included in gatherings, he would bring them and put them right next to him, kiss them on their head. In a hadith, he says, um, when someone loves their brother, let them tell them that they love them. He's encouraging other people, tell, if you have love for somebody in your heart, let them know, verbalize it. Encouraging others to show that emotion. We know that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he used to hear certain verses of the Quran, he would just weep in prayer, weep. Even they say that some lines of poetry caught his heart, that he would cry from the emotions that would bring up. Why is this important for us as spiritual care providers? For me, it's important because it's telling us how the Prophet ﷺ was authentic. He was in the moment. He wasn't afraid to be who he was in a culture that at the time doesn't support male emotion. And I think it's kind of the same still today, subhanAllah. He was authentic. He was in the moment, and he joined people. He didn't block himself off. 
he let the emotions come through. And you know what that did for other people? What it does, I see, is that it gives other people permission to show their emotion as well. You're giving people that permission. You're joining them. You're being with them. Sallallahu alayhi wa The second attribute that I found... This is the wrong slide. There we go. The second attribute that I found was he was not judgmental. We really enjoy being judgmental, so this is hard for us. He covered other people's mistakes, even when it was right in front of him. One of my favorite stories that I found in the seerah was when a man came to him, sallallahu alayhi, and he, um, he confided in him and confessed that he had had relations with his wife in Ramadan. And he said, what do I do? Advise me. And the Prophet um, told him, give in charity. And the man said, I don't have anything to give. So the Prophet, again, وسلم, with such gentleness, he took a, a date and he gave it to the man. He said, here's something to give. Go give it in charity. And the man still he insisted, he said, well, I, I don't have anything. Why can't I have the date? Imagine this. And the Prophet Wasallam said, take, go ahead and take the date. And he smiled, and he just let the man go. Look at the, Wasallam, the mercy and the kindness and the softness that he brings to people who are coming to him with wearing everything on their sleeve. One of my favorite parts is that he saw the best in others and he helped them see it in themselves. Think about yourself where you were spiritually 10 years ago. Inshallah, we've all grown since then in our spirituality, in our religion. But imagine those who you love now saw the person who you were, was, were ten, 10 years ago. Who stood by your side? Who was patient with you while you got through what you needed to get through in order to be who you are today? Who were the people that stood by you and said, this is not you forever, you're still growing, and I'm going to have patience with you? Thank those people because it's not easy. And inshallah, in another 10 years, you won't be the same person who you are today. In other words, the Prophet Sallallahu had this amazing wisdom that he knew that people were not stuck in a place, that they could be coaxed and they could be moved and they can deepen their spirituality. And he had such patience with them. He saw the good in them. So a quick story with this one. We know from the seerah that the Prophet ﷺ used to give different answers to different people because he understood that not everybody is the same. So the two examples that I found was one, the famous story of the Bedouin who comes into the, the masjid and he urinates, right? How many of us know that story? So a Bedouin comes and, and he gets off his camel, he ties his camel, he goes into the musalla where we pray and he urinates. And the companions come and they're furious and they're like, what is he doing? Let's throw him out. And the Prophet said, let him finish. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let him finish. Thank you. So he let the man finish what he was doing and then he instructed his companions, not the man, his companions take this bucket of water and throw it and just clean it and let the man be. And then he went to the man in private, sallallahu alayhi, and he explained to him, maybe you don't know this, but this is a place of prayer, and we try and keep it clean. Contrast that with a city man or a man who lived amongst the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the companions. One day he came to the masjid and he was wearing a bright yellow shirt a bright yellow shirt. And the Prophet وسلم, went to him and he told him, it's probably better to wear a different color. 
Look at the two different men coming from two different backgrounds, two very different um, offenses or, or things that they brought to the masjid and the two different ways that the Prophet handled both of them because he had that understanding, he could read people. He had that wisdom, sallallahu alayhi wa And just to um, one ayah, whoops. It was by the mercy of God that you were gentle with them, for if you had been severe or harsh-hearted, they would have broken away from you. So Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Qur'an the importance of why the Prophet's mercy was, was a big deal, was so important to us. If he had not been, our ummah would not be where it is today. And for us, as followers of our beloved Prophet ﷺ, when we embody that mercy and we show others mercy, inshallah, it will continue to grow. And then a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, God is gentle and he loves gentleness in everything. He was gentle. And everything that he did was beauty and mercy and love and gentleness. There is no man who was like him, and there is no man who ever will be like him. But we, we can try to embody what he's taught us in his stories. So a pastoral way of listening and replying. This is really important for us in the work that we do when we're with patients, and we're taking the time out to sit with them and listen to them. Look at the ways that the Prophet Wasallam, such small, subtle things, but they make all the difference. The first one, which is really interesting, and I learned recently, he was never the first one to draw his hand back. So when, when somebody sticks their hand out to, to give the handshake, he waits until the other person removes it. He was never the first one to take it away. Why is this important to us as chaplains? When we talk about patient-centered care, this is patient-centered care. He lets the other person lead. He's not leading it. He says, you take your time, as much time as you need. Look at the beauty, look at the beauty in that. Try it next time. It's really interesting, the reaction. I do it with hugs with my kids. When they come and they hug me, I'm not the first one to pull back, I wait. And they take a long time, subhanAllah. The second example is, we know this about him, where he turned toward the person who was talking to him so fully and so in the present that people who talked to him would tell each other, I felt like I was the most important person in the world when I was talking to him, sallallahu alayhi. Whoever it was, he would give them such full presence and attention. And this is hard to do. This is not easy to give everybody that full attention that they deserve, not thinking about what's going on next, not checking your phone, not having your body even turned this way in your face, just fully, completely present and immersed. And the other person felt it. We have this recorded in the sira where they, they would talk and they would say, I felt like I was the most important person to him, sallallahu alayhi With presence, I also find it interesting that a lot of the hadith that we have begin with companions narrating and saying, we were hanging out with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa We were sitting with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa And he would say, have you ever thought about the importance of that beginning part? We usually just skip to the rest of the hadith. But if you think about it, they were learning from him because he was with them and amongst them and he was present. He didn't just walk up, give them a, a lecture, give them a talk, give them advice, and then leave. He was with them. The connection and the relationship was already there, that it was easy for them to listen. Their hearts were open already. Anything that he would say, sallallahu alayhi wa And then lastly, empowering others. This is also, everything's my favorite, so I'm gonna keep saying it's my favorite. This is one that I really, really love. He empowered those who were in his presence. And what does that mean? 
That means that he would give them the tools to be able to speak up for themselves, to have courage. So he was a patient advocate, right? We talk about how we advocate for our patients. But when he wasn't there, sallallahu alayhi, he taught the patient or the person, the care seeker with him, how to do it for themselves. There's a beautiful story of his wife, Sophia, who was from a Jewish tribe. And when she married the Prophet وسلم, and came and joined his wives, they would talk about her. And they would point out the fact that she was from a Jewish tribe. And this hurt her. So she went to the Prophet وسلم, and she was telling him, no, so and so, and this is what they're doing. And so he would go and he would talk to the wives and say, this isn't right. But he also said, here's what you do. Next time they say this to you, you tell them, my father is Ibrahim and my uncle is Musa. So he gave her words and he empowered her so that when, even when he's not there, when he's there, he stands up for her. But even when he's not there, in his absence, she knows exactly what to say and it silences them because they can't say anything about that. How, how can they talk back to that? My father is Ibrahim. My uncle is Musa. This is a commonality between them. Sallallahu alayhi. Now even more relevant to our work, the etiquette of visiting the sick from the example of the Prophet The first one, and very, very important, he spoke words of hope. When he came in to visit somebody who was sick, he didn't bring the bad news with him, depression, sadness. On his tongue was, were words of hope. Inshallah, this is a purification for you. Inshallah, Ya Rabbi, you get better. You know, praying for the person. He didn't come in to make it worse. I know that sounds funny to think, why would somebody do that? But believe me, it's not as common sense as you might think. Another one um, of the points that I read, and this is really, I found this really interesting. When he prays for somebody, he used to rub the person who was sick with his right hand and say a prayer of shifa, of healing. But when you think about the importance of this, of touch, right? There's so much research done of the power of touch, how you connect to the other person. It's not just words, right? That you extend your hand and you put your hand on their body. This is the example of our beloved, sallallahu alayhi. I had a patient who didn't speak English and I didn't speak her language. And she was crying. She was very distressed. And so the nurse asked me to go in and so the patient was Muslim and the nurse thought that just because we were both Muslim that we immediately spoke the same language. So she said, oh, you, you can go in and you can see her. I think she needs some support. So I get, go in and I realize she doesn't speak Arabic. I speak Arabic and English. She doesn't speak either of those. What can I do? So I sat next to her. I spoke to her in my language, even though she couldn't understand. The tone of voice was very important. And I just put my hand over hers. And I sat for 70 minutes, one hour and 10 minutes, just holding her hand while she cried. And she cried for more than half of that time. The nurse would come in, she would see us just sitting there, and I felt so silly. She's probably thinking, what is she, she's not doing anything. And I had to fight myself. I had to fight the urge to turn on the TV for her. Oh, well, why don't you watch something? Or to say, can I read you from the Quran? Alhamdulillah, with my training, I was able to notice those thoughts coming into my head and say, no, no, that's not what she needs. Just wait. Just wait. And we sat and we held hands. And then when she felt like she was done, subhanAllah, she turned and she looked at me and she said, I'm okay. I said, alhamdulillah. And that's it. 
and I never saw her again. But the power of touch, sometimes when we don't have words to say, touch is very, very powerful. And then these two hadith that probably in the hospital we've heard many, many times before and we know so well. Prophet Sallallahu said, a Muslim visiting his sick brother or sister will continue to be in the harvest of paradise until he or she returns home. Another hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, a visitor walking to visit a sick person will be waiting in the mercy of God. And I want to pause here on this word waiting. Waiting means just walking into water very, very slowly, like shallow water, but you're taking your time. You're really enjoying it. When the visitor sits with the sick one, they will be immersed in mercy until his or her return. We all have the honor and the privilege of visiting the sick. Look at the position that our beloved Prophet ﷺ is encouraging us and saying this is what we have. Do you feel it? Do you feel it when you're sitting with patients? Do you feel like you are waiting, like you are slowly being immersed in Allah's mercy? When I started my work at the hospital, my life changed. Blessings upon blessings upon blessings, alhamdulillah. I couldn't tell where they were coming from. And then one day I was reading these and I said, oh, no, no wonder. The mercy of Rabbil Alameen, when you extend mercy to his creation, he drowns you in his, subhanAllah. This slide is really important for me as a Muslim chaplain working in a Christian hospital. When I began to read about the ways that the Prophet ﷺ dealt with people who were not Muslim, the first story, and I had never read it in this way, about the woman who used to throw garbage. How many of you know that story? The one who used to throw garbage on him? And one day she was sick. And the Prophet ﷺ knew that because he went out and he noticed that there was no garbage on him that day. There was no garbage in his path. And he started asking around, where is that woman? And they said, oh, she's sick at home. What religion was she? Was she Muslim? No. Such a small detail and I had never thought about it before, subhanAllah. She wasn't Muslim. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he, did he do? He went and he visited her in her, in her home. And the beauty of that. Khadija radiallahu anha, and in my other presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about her and the way that she was the first chaplain in our tradition. So that's, an, that's a fun story, it'll come later. But one of the ways that she was a chaplain was that she connected the Prophet ﷺ when he came back after hearing the recitation for the first time and he was so scared. She said, let's take you to my cousin who was Christian, Waraka, and maybe he'll be able to help us. So she didn't know exactly what was going on, but she referred him out to somebody none other than her family member who was a Christian, she said, we can trust him. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ had family members who were not Muslim and who he treated with not just respect, but love. And then very quickly, one of my favorite stories that, he, uh, that I read about him وسلم, is the way that he looked for common ground with those who were around him. So we know the story of Abyssinia, how the, uh, how the early Muslims were being persecuted in Mecca, and they sought permission from the king of Abyssinia to go and migrate there and have safety there. And the Prophet ﷺ talked about uh, Abyssinia as a land and sincerity of religion. So he acknowledged their religion and their sincerity. He said, these are good people. Go to the king and he will provide you with safety. And when they talked to the king of Abyssinia, 
they brought to him the story of Mary, Maryam, and they talked about the commonalities between them. They didn't bring up the things that were different, although there were differences, and they acknowledged that. They chose what was in common. And when he was in Ta'if, when he was in Ta'if and he sought refuge in the garden, and he was crying and he made that beautiful, powerful dua, in the garden, the orchard owners, the owners of it, they were not Muslim. But they saw that this was a man who was suffering. And they sent their slave boy who was Christian to go and give him something to eat. And in some narrations, they say that he also dressing his wounds because he was bleeding. And the boy came to him. And when he offered him the food, he heard the Prophet ﷺ say, Bismillah. And he said, where, where, what is this word? I had never heard of this word. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, where are you from? And the boy said, I am Christian of the people of Nineveh. And the Prophet ﷺ replied in a way that was affirming of him and said, oh, this is from the city of Jonah. And the boy was so surprised. He said, how do you know my Prophet? And then there were narr narrations that say that he accepted Islam. But we see in these stories how the Prophet came from a place of commonality. He had the wisdom to choose the right words to help the other person feel affirmed in their faith, but also find common ground, somewhere where their hearts can connect. Remember, the Prophet is about heart connection with people. And that's why they loved him so much, sallallahu alayhi, and that's why we love him so much. And then finally, about the Medina Charter. When they moved to Medina, it was well known that there were tribes there that were of Jewish faith. They weren't all Muslim, but they were able to coexist in a way that tribes had not been able to from before. So when I read about these examples of my beloved Prophet Sallallahu and I think about the people who I'm serving in my hospital in America and the ways that they have their rituals and their traditions that bring them comfort just like mine. I have to be very creative to think about the ways that I can help serve them and bring them respect and bring them dignity and bring them hope. So quick story, this was a great learning lesson for me. Um, there was a woman who was in so much pain that I remember she was lying down in her bed and she couldn't get in a comfortable position. She kept moving and moving her legs and moving her arms. She was just thrashing around in her bed from the amount of pain that her body was feeling. Nothing I could say. No, she didn't want to be touched. She didn't want to hear anything. Watching somebody in pain like that I cannot tell you the effect that it has, feeling so helpless that you cannot help somebody. And her husband came in, and he, in passing, he said something about how they were very faithful people. They had a church. And I think he probably mentioned something about Bible. And I said, ah. And I asked her, I, I came close to her, and I said, do you, do you have a favor, favorite Bible story or passage? And she said, yeah, Psalm, I think it was 129 or 139. So I had my phone with me, and I picked up my phone, and I just Googled it. I searched it on Google, and I started reading from it. Within seconds, her body relaxed. She was calm. And I kept reading for her, and she just almost even fell asleep to the point where I stopped reading, and I just started walking out of the room like this, not wanting to interrupt her. If it was me in her position, and somebody came in and she was reading to the Bi from the Bible to me, it's not going to do anything. But if they read from the Qur'an, that touches my heart. That's familiar to me. And I would hope, inshallah, that that would be reciprocated. I think we have a session on this in a little bit, um, so I won't take too long here. 
But the way that the Prophet ﷺ was with people at the time of death, again, presence. So there was a beautiful story where the Prophet ﷺ was visiting the grave of Ruqayya, his daughter. And he was with his other daughter, Fatima. And according to one narrative, it said that tears were pouring from Fatima's eyes as she sat beside her father at the edge of the grave. This is her sister, sister's grave, but this is the Prophet's daughter, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And listen to this, he says, and he comforted her and dried his tear, her tears with the corner of his cloak. He had his cloak and he dried her tears. The pain that he was feeling, right, and put that aside and he was tending to his daughter and her pain sallallahu alaihi naming the deceased this is something so small but how often do we remember to do it first of all learning the name of the person who has who has just died taking the time to learn what is this person's name and using it in the prayer so there was a story where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was approached by a woman whose son had just died and she was so distraught and she went to him and she said ya rasulullah if my son is in paradise i can be patient tell me he's in paradise and the prophet sallallahu alaihi he answered and he said yes fulan your son he used his name is in paradise something so small but if you read in other parts of the seerah the Prophet ﷺ used to answer this question to other people in general terms, not using a specific name, but with this woman whose son had just died, look at the wisdom and the beauty of him using his name. He had just died, her son. Think about what that communicates to the mother, that her son is worth it, that there's dignity to him, that there's respect. That he, is, he was a life, he is a soul. And there, there is a belief that the soul remains close to the body even after death. That it remains there and it hears. Call the person by their name. They're there. And we learn this from our beloved Prophet ﷺ. Delivering the news and attending to children. There was another story in the seerah where a beloved companion of the Prophet had passed away and it was up to the Prophet to go and tell the family وسلم, that he had died. Does this sound familiar to those of us who are in this work? But look at the way that he did it He went to the house and he called for the children of this companion and he delivered the news to them and he took them and he hugged them and he kissed them and then he went on and he cried with the family. Alhamdulillah, I haven't had any bad experiences where somebody had to break a news to me or to my children. But I remember one time, the first time that I went and I visited with the chaplain at my hospital, I had my two kids with me. I couldn't leave them at home. So they came with me on the tour of the hospital. And the entire time, the chaplain was talking to them. Do you know what a chaplain does? Do you know, okay, well, here's my job and here's what I do at the hospital. And I was like, I'm right here. Why is he talking to my kids? But you know what I realized? I was hanging on to every word that he was saying. I was listening with more attention than if he was telling me because these are my kids. I'm saying, what is he telling my kids? I was listening the whole time, and he had their attention. So there were the three of us. He had all of our attention together by, by targeting or, or talking to the children. I learned a very big lesson in this. And when I heard this story, I said, aha, I know why. I know why. Because we're so interested in what somebody else is doing with our own kids. And the Prophet wasallam put them first. He didn't ignore them. He didn't dismiss them, he was there with them, sallallahu alayhi. 
and connecting with the community. And the last part of that story was that he rounded up the neighbors of that family that he came and broke the news, and he asked them, make some food. So he brought people in. He brought in the community, sallallahu alayhi. He didn't do it on his own, and he gave other people an opportunity to help. How many times do we have tragic situations or sad cases that come to the hospital and you find people they just want to help please tell me what i can do they're so moved by what happens we learn from the example example of our beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi that he used the community and brought them in he was the first point of contact but then his in his wisdom he goes out because he can't do it on his own sallallahu alaihi he gives other people opportunity to share in that. So I just brought a few stories and examples that I had found in the seerah of our beloved Prophet Wasallam. And when I started my work at the hospital, they asked me to do a presentation on how is Islamic or Muslim spiritual care different from Christian spiritual care. And these are the five points that I came up with, and I just want to share them here with you. Number one, that they're rooted in the Quran, our spiritual care, our tradition. Now listen, this is very important to me, because as the only Muslim chaplain, where everything else is in Christian terms, I had to translate this for myself and make it meaningful for me. Why am I doing this work? What's my motivation? Number one, that it's rooted in the Quran. This is our duty. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we and the jinn were worshiped to uh, serve him, this is our service. Remember the love and the service. And I'm trying to live up to the example of our beloved Prophet ﷺ. Number two, emphasizes hospitality. Dr. Ishaq talked about the culture of salam, which is what you're trying to do here. Hospitality, right? Hospital, hospitality. As the spiritual care provider, imagine that you are inviting people into your home. This is your home. What do you do when you have guests? You greet them, you make them feel welcome, you bring them tea, you bring them something to eat, you make sure that they're comfortable, you make sure that they have everything that they have, that they feel valued and that they feel honored, no matter who comes through your door. And I know that you're very good at this because, alhamdulillah, I've been the recipient of it here. And I feel it. Do the same thing when you're here at work. This is your home and you are the host the culture of salam, of, of a hospitality, of warmth. Number three, we talked about maqasid al-sharia very briefly, but how our spiritual care, it incorporates our legal tradition and the rituals when applicable. Number four, very, very important, we bring hope. We bring hope to people. We bring them comfort, and we bring them peace in their heart. This is our job. And then number five, the fard kifaya, right? That we are doing a job on behalf of other people in our community. This is hard work. It's not easy work. Do you ever have people come up to you and say, I don't know how you do this job? Right? How do you do it? How do you go in and see patients day after day? How do you deal with sick people? How do you deal with deaths? Think about the answer that you give them. Why? Your ability to do it, I believe, is a gift from Rabbil Alameen. Because it's true, not everybody can do it. But you're here for a reason. And you're doing it for a reason. And this is a gift from Rabbil Alameen. And a responsibility. And I'll close with this. The reason that this is so important for me and the reason that I took time to reread the seerah from the lens of a chaplain is because we need to bring this back to our ummah. We need to bring back this example of the Prophet ﷺ and the way that he showed love and compassion and what it really means for him to be mercy to mankind. 
And it's not going to come back unless we bring it back. We need to revive it. And you're in the perfect position, the perfect position to bring this back. What an honor. And I'll just close with saying that you make a difference. One time when I was in a group, I heard another chaplain say something that was very profound, and I kept it with me. She said, as a chaplain or as a nurse or as a physician here in the hospital, my every day is somebody else's worst day. My every day at work is somebody else's worst day. They didn't expect to be there in the emergency room. They didn't schedule it in. You did. You make a difference. Because you're coming in with this idea of love and service. Remember this formula. You feel the love in your heart, which is a gift from Rabbil Alameen, and you're giving it to others through your service to them. Remember the heart to heart. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to uh, keep this love in our hearts and make it grow, inshallah, and that he remains with you and that he showers his blessings and mercy upon you and your family and protects you all and uh, forgives us, Ya Rab. I mean, thank you very much. Yeah, are there any questions? Kita buka kepada sesi soal jawab. If there are any question, please. Thank you. Hello, assalamu alaikum. My name is Nabil. I'm a psychiatrist. So um, it, it was a interesting and very um, uh, inspiring talk. Thank you. Especially, uh, you know, you, you're reminding us about the, the teachings of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I have uh, um, a question, or well, maybe you can share your experience in dealing with patients who have uh, spiritual crisis or spiritual struggle on how you can you know help them to to gain their faith back to gain their faith back oh man how much time do we have <laughs> it's a really good question and i'm i'm hesitating or i'm struggling with helping them get their faith back we know that there, la ikraha fid deen, that hidayah comes from Rabbil Alameen. But I think that a lot of people have been hurt by religious leaders or by a misunderstanding of the faith. And there's a lack of connection between the person and God. So as a chaplain, the main word that I'm focusing on is connection. How do I reconnect you to that source of what you find comforting and peaceful and loving, no matter what the faith tradition is? And I really, I know I've said this for the past 45 minutes, but your example is the first gateway towards that. With the love and the service, you're reintroducing foundational elements of the deen, most basic, to reintroduce them to that connection. So one time, last month, I was at a youth camp, and I was speaking to a girl who, she didn't want to reveal her identity, so she wrote me a note, and she passed it to me, and her note was very uh, heartbreaking. And so I asked her counselor, I was at a camp, is there any way that she can just come and talk to me? There's no way I can do this letter writing back and forth. 
So she eventually came, alhamdulillah, and she started talking about how you know, her parents at home are very uh, controlling, that they're all about forcing religion on her, they're forcing her to wear hijab, forcing her to pray. In other words, there's no heart to heart. And she said something that broke my heart. She said, I hate the Qur'an. I hate the Qur'an. I hate hearing it. I hate listening to it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I had like, what, two hours with her? And all I could do was just sit and listen. Like the Prophet's example, sallallahu I was listening so much that my head started to hurt after a while because it was just so intense and her story was so intense. Your body feels it. But just sitting and listening and listening and listening and she cried. After two hours, you can see the difference in her body and her face. She was mad, she was angry. She wasn't looking me in the eye. After that talk, you just felt like, oh, shut her. Like there was light back in her face. I didn't fix anything. I don't know what happened to her, but I hope that just through my example of just being there and being loving and empathetic, no matter what she was saying, it didn't, I didn't let her see that it shocked me. When she said that, I wasn't like, oh, no, astaghfirullah, sister, you shouldn't say that. I held it in, I just, okay, she's had a really bad experience. So in other words, the Prophet ﷺ, when they t he talked about how he had wisdom with answering people different ways because he knew their different backgrounds. While we don't have that, the, the wisdom and insight that he does, we can at least appreciate and understand that everybody is coming with a story. Everybody is coming with a different background, with different families, with different circumstances, with different hardships. And when we sit and we listen and really try and understand, why are you this way? Why are you saying these things? This is just the first step. And Allahu Alam, maybe you're the seed that gets planted, and maybe 10 people later is when that person will find their faith. Allahu Alam, but we do what we can, right? Allah make it easy for you, inshallah.